Welcome. Let us revisit the problem that we were looking at last, namely trying to develop the equation for the area of a circle using techniques of integration of calculus. But in this video, let's show that a much more robust a approach is available to us by something as simple as a change in our coordinates, namely if we were to go from the Cartesian coordinates that we used in the last video to just changing the coordinates in polar form, you will see that there is a great savings or economy in computation that is afforded to us just by something that simple. Polar coordinates, as you may recall, are described by the ordered pair r and theta. In Cartesian coordinates, of course, we had x comma y. Here, a point on the circle is located at some radial distance r from the origin. Let me go ahead and actually put the r down here. And that point is also defined at some angle theta measured counterclockwise from my Cartesian coordinate axis x. As I did in the last problem where I used um, a differential strip, in this problem I'm going to use a differential wedge. And the differential wedge will look something like this, such that this interior angle here that I've just drawn is the differential measure of theta, the angle. And what we would like to do is find the area of this differential wedge, which is nearly a triangle. Now, of course, I've drawn this in an exaggerated view. It's a differential wedge, so it's going to be infinitesimally small in its size. But if you were to look at the base of this triangle, it's going to have some arc length. Let me denote that by this symbol here. And then the question is, what is the arc length that forms the base of this near triangular shape? A way to remember how to find arc lengths, such as the one I've drawn here, is a motivation to remember that, is to remember uh, the extreme case for the arc length of a circle. So. If I were to look at the arc length of this circle starting here at the x-axis and moving, let's say, all the way around this circle, uh, I would call that arc length my circumference. So the arc length of entire circle is the circumference and it is commonly denoted with the capital letter C and we know that the formula for that is 2 pi times the radial length r. This 2 pi here happens to be the interior angle of the entire thing that we're interested in, namely for the entire circle. So to start at x and go one full revolution and wind up back at x, that is a angle angular measure of 2 pi radians. And so, if you can just understand the equation
for the circumference of the entire circle, then you can find the equation for a portion of the arc length of a circle as we've drawn here very simply. Namely, it's going to be the interior angle times the radial length. So that is nothing other than r times d theta. To find the differential area of this wedge, let me denote that as dA, then, is going to be one-half the base times the height of this triangular wedge. So that'll be one-half. The base is, of course, the arc length, times the height. And you'll notice that the height is also just a radial length r. And so we have dA, the differential area of this wedge, is one half the base, the arc length, times the height, the radial length r. So let's put this information in for the arc length. So that means that dA is equal to one half r d theta times r, or the differential area of that wedge is one half r squared d theta. Theta is in this case varying between, of course for the full circle, it's going to vary between zero and when we come back full circle it'll be 2 pi radians when we turn back one revolution around. So if I were to now integrate both sides of this, I'm going to get A on the left hand side is equal to the integral of one half r squared d theta where theta ranges between zero and two pi. The one half and the r squared terms are all constants. As a result, I can pull all of that out of my integration, and so we get that A, the area, is equal to one-half R squared, the integral going between zero and two pi of d theta. This is a very simple integration to perform, unlike the last example that we did where we were working with Cartesian coordinates, we had to use or you're not limited to use the techniques that I presented there. I did that for a very specific reason to illustrate two very powerful techniques of integration. One, as you'll recall, was the trigonometric substitution approach and the second being the popular integration by parts approach. But in this case, just by choosing something like polar coordinates rather than the Cartesian coordinates, notice how simple our integral is going to be. So this is simply one-half r squared times theta. That's the integral of d theta evaluated between the limits of zero and two pi. This works out to being one-half r squared two pi from the upper bound minus zero from the lower bound. And so a is simply one-half r squared times two pi. The twos cancel from bottom and top, and we're left with what we expected, that the area is equal to pi r squared. So to summarize very quickly then, the 
savings in computational time by being judicious in our choosing of the coordinates, in this case, polar coordinates, really gave us a great savings in how much effort and time we put forth to come up with the same exact result from the last time. I hope that helps, and uh, I hope to see you in a future video once again.